the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. We come before you, Lord, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. God, we don't take it for granted. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, or we don't come into this place to hear from a woman. But Father, we come into this place to hear from you, and we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to plant the seed of the word of God into our hearts tonight, that it might go and bear much fruit in our lives, that we would be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us, Father, and we thank you for all the things that you have done for us in our lives thus far. We know that this is just the start. Lord, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Father... We ask that you would not just bless us, but Lord, bless all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ on this Memorial Day weekend. Father, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Baptist and Methodist and Episcopalian and Presbyterian brothers and sisters and our Lutheran brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you for all the churches locally and around the Inland Empire for Harvest uh, and, and the Sandals in the Grove, Ecclesia. Father, I thank you for Emmanuel Baptist, for the, the various Calvary chapels all across the state of California and around the United States. Lord, I thank you for Abundant Living and Oak Valley. Lord, for Crossroads. Lord, we ask that you set your hand upon our brothers and sisters in the desert at Coachella. Father, our brothers and sisters in Temecula at the Rock and our brothers and sisters in San Diego and in Coastal Hills at the Rock. And Father, our brothers and sisters in South Riverside. Lord, we thank you for the many brothers and sisters we have in the body of Christ. Lord, we all, many members of one body, the body of Christ, working to build and to grow the kingdom of God for your glory. And Father, to you be all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And Lord, I ask today on this night, Lord, that your comfort and your peace would be about those who have lost family and friends and loved ones in the, in the line of duty, Father, in the public service sector as well as in the armed forces. Father, I thank you for protection for those who are out abroad overseas right now fighting for the freedoms that we enjoy. God, I ask that your hand be upon them, Lord, that no weapon formed against them should prosper. Lord, I thank you for your hand of protection about them. Lord, I ask for those that have come and have returned. Lord, that your hand of of, of grace be upon them. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak and minister to them to show them things in their life, to give them fulfillment in what they've done. And Lord, we thank you for the, the many freedoms that we have here in this nation, Lord. And we ask today, on this Memorial Day week and a special prayer for our leadership our, 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 of our nation and of our states and of our governments. Lord, I ask that you would just set your hand upon them. Father, guide this country, Lord, uh, as it's written in our currency. In God we trust, Lord, we put our trust in you in this place, Father. We thank you that you have afforded us the blessings and the rights to come and to freely worship you, Lord, where others die around the world that they might just read a page of the Bible. Father, here we are tonight to freely worship and to seek after you. And Lord, we don't take that for granted and we thank you for the blessings that you have given to us. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, amen. Amen. Well, praise God. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians into the third chapter. Got a a fun message tonight, something that I, I know that will bless you. I know that will increase your life and increase the quality of life if we can grab a hold of some of the things. And as I was reading this passage of Scripture, the Lord really had spoken to me. One of the things that I had done and I had made use of uh, uh, quite a while back, it was one of the things that we learned while we were at Bible college many years ago, is oftentimes we pray, but we don't know what to pray. Oftentimes I'll pray in the Spirit and let let the Spirit of God edify my soul. But then there are times when I pray and I just open up the Word of God and I begin to pray the Scriptures over my life. On several occasions, especially from Paul the Apostle, he he writes exhortations or he writes things that, uh, uh, prayers for the churches that, that he prays for them. And oftentimes what I'll do is I'll take those prayers that Paul has written down to the churches and I'll replace the you's and the yours and the, and the thou's or whatever it might be with mine and I and pray those prayers over myself. And this is one of the prayers that oftentimes in my life I'll pray over myself just because I believe that I that God has got something great and special and and in store for my life, and I know that God's got something great and special in store for your life. Now, the title of tonight's message is this, Supersize Me. Supersize Me. Now, this is a phrase coined by the fast food industry 
Oftentimes nowadays, uh, due to the, uh, uh, the documentary that came out some years ago about uh, the health benefits, or I should say lack thereof, of fast food, this phrase has kind of gained itself kind of a negative connotation within the fast food industry. A lot of times they've changed their verbiage uh, in the upsale. If you don't know what an upsell is, you've experienced this whenever you've bought something at one of those fast food uh, restaurants where they'll ask, would you like to uh, upsize that? Or would you like to go uh, power size that? Or uh, I think it was McDonald's that used the word supersize that, which instead, rather than the standard size, it was the large Coke and the large fries. And it would, they wanted to make sure that you left that restaurant full. That no question that you had satisfied your hunger. Well, even though it might have negative connotations with our more health conscious society in this day and age, you know, I want to talk about supersizing you and me. Because you know what? As Christians, it is God's intent, it is God's desire for us to live a supersized life. Amen. You know, oftentimes, I think over tradition and over the years of those who have lived a, a, a very pious life and through different forms of, of, of religion and different forms or, or different branches of Christianity, we get this impression that God's desire is for us to have nothing, to have this lowly, self-pitiful uh, self life so that we have nothing to hold on to. Therefore, we look to God. But truly, as a father is to his son, it is God's desire for us to be blessed. It is God's desire desire for us to be happy. It is God's desire for you and I as Christians, as children of God, to live a fulfilled life of happiness and of, of blessings. And the difference is, is as we've been going through this journey over the past few weeks here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center of a financial or a capital stewardship campaign, some of the things that we've learned is that God uh, wants to bless us, but God will not bless us or God will not put his hand of blessing upon our lives, specifically in the area of finances, until our hearts are in line or in tune with his will and his ways. Why? Because just like uh, we've experienced in our life many a time when things are good in our lives we often forget the things of God or the need that we have for God but when things are bad in our lives or when things are hard in our lives we turn our eyes and fix our eyes to God so if we can deal with the matters of the heart if we can deal with the matters of the inside especially when it comes to regarding our finances then many other things in our life will follow suit and it is truly God's intent for you and I to live a life that is supersized when you go into that restaurant and you order that number one combo meal and you get it supersized. You get it supersized for a reason. Why is that? Because you're hungry. You went into that place with a need and you left that place fulfilled or literally filled. It's the same thing in our lives. We come to God with a need, a need for something more, not just solely a need for the material, not just solely a need for provision. Those are things that God will take care of in the peripheral, but rather a need for something more in our lives, a need for a reason to live, a reason to exist. And we find that and we go and God says, you know what, I'm going to supersize you. And when we find that we have been supersized or fulfilled by the word and by the, the, the power of God, we leave fulfilled, we leave the church fulfilled, we leave the places which we are fed, filled and ready to go. You see, church isn't just designed for you and I to come and fill up our gas tanks. Although it is, that is a reason that you and I come, our spiritual gas tanks, so that we can come and be filled. But rather, it is a place, God, the Bible tells us, for the equipping of the saints. So that you and I can come and learn and grab a hold of the, of the word of God. Grab a hold of the things in our lives so that you and I can be equipped to do the things that God has called us to do. To go out so that we can also fill the gas tanks or the, the spiritual gas tanks of those who are in need around us. That is why God wants us to be supersized over in abundance, over in abundance of the things of God, over in abundance of the knowledge of God, over in abundance of, of, of our wealth, not just our physical, financial wealth, but we, we've, we've talked about this over the weeks, that wealth can be defined over by so many more things than just money. Your wealth can be considered your health. 
Your wealth could be considered the resources that are around you. How about the time that you've been given here on, on, on earth, the short vapor time that we have? That's a wealth of, of time that God has given us that we can use and apply to our lives to live our lives to the fullest or to live our lives to be supersized. And if we grab a hold of the concepts and the precepts of God, I'll tell you what, we live a life that is truly blessed. We live a life that is fulfilled. We live a life that has meaning to it. And so here in Ephesians in the third chapter, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church. In verse number 14, he begins to exhort them. And he says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's talking about this reason being, listen, I've gone through some things in my life. There's some things I have a calling in my life and I'm, and I'm believing for you. Don't, don't, don't be heavy hearted for me. But for this reason, for the reason that here I am preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to you, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would, this is Paul's prayer for you and I. That he, speaking of God, would grant to you and I, according to the riches of God, his glory, to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, you and I, the church, would be rooted and grounded in love. That we may be able to comprehend or understand with all of the saints, those around us, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know, to understand, to grab a hold of the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, I love this verse. This is a verse that you and I quote, or you and I believe, or we stand on oftentimes in our life. Verse number 20, Paul goes on to say, Now to him, now to who? To God, to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in who? Us. To him, to God, be the glory in the, the what? Church, you and I, by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Verse number 20 says to him, now to him who is able to do, able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. Do you know what that means? That means to him who is there, that when you call upon his name, that when you come to the feet of Jesus Christ, when you come and submit yourself to the rulership and the leadership of God, when he would say to you, to him who says, supersize me. So you see, it is God's desire. These are, these are a, a, a descriptive words, exceedingly, meaning over and above, abundantly, abounding, running towards, flowing over in your favor, above all that we could ask or think, well beyond our expectations. You know, when you go to the restaurant, when you go to that fast food chain, when you go to eat that garbage junk food that makes you feel bad, that gives you indigestion anyways, you know, half the time you go, you don't expect to be upsold. But when they ask you the question, hey, for 99 cents more, you get all this extra. You sit there at the cash register. You've been there before probably too. I know some of your health nuts are like, uh-uh, I ain't never been there before. I ain't never going to be there, but just play with me anyways. You sit there and you go, oh, you know why not? For 99 cents, I might as well get the, I'm, I'm a little hungry. I'm going to get that pound and a half of fries. I'm going to get that 96-ounce drink because it's hot outside. And it says here to God that can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We come to God with our expectations of life. Lord, I come and I, I hope and I pray and I believe, I have faith that I'm going to be blessed. Lord, I believe that I'm going to be filled. And God says, listen, what you believe is going to be blessing, what you believe is going to be fulfillment, ain't nothing compared to what I have in store for you. Why? Because it is God's intention for us to live a supersized life. So tonight I thought it would be fun, just quickly, just, just some thoughts out of the Word of God about what a supersized life is in terms of our relationships, in terms of our fulfillment, in terms of what we do with this time on earth, what a supersized life is. You see, it's a choice, just like at the fast food restaurant. It's a choice. They ask you before they do it, would you? 
like to be supersized. You and I can look at our relationships with God and we can say, you know, God, I'd rather just exist. All right? That's your decision. That's your choice. Or you can say, you know what? I am going to choose to live a supersized life. A life of blessing, a life of health, a life of fulfillment, a life of involvement, a life of influence. So tonight, I want to take a quick look, just some, some fun things about what a supersized life is. A supersized life is, well, is the statement I'll say, and we'll complete that four times tonight. So number one for tonight, a supersized life is hardy in hard times. A supersized life is... An abundant, an exceeding, an abounding life is hardy in hard times. Now, hard times are often, well, before I go any further, the thought of hard times is very familiar to each and every one of us. Did you know that we have experienced hard times in America? We have experienced hard economical and financial times in this great recession that we have been going through. And they say that there's light at the end of the tunnel. They say that things are getting better and house prices are going back up and the stock market is rebounding. But if anything, during these hard times, you and I have become aware that wealth in the world system, that finances in the world system, that uh, identity within the world system has become a fickle thing that can change overnight and that we don't base much trust in the forecasts of the economy anymore because we know that it can go up and down. And a supersized life is hardy in hard times. Why? Because hard times are the times that press us, that really show who we are, the identity of what we are. Much like the illustration of Job long ago in the Bible when the devil and, and the Lord have a conversation together and the Lord says to the devil, have you considered my servant Job and he won't curse my name? And the devil says, well, lift your umbrella of protection and I'll get him to curse your name. In hard times is when we find our true identity. And when we find our true identity, we realize just who we are. We realize just how close to God or how far away from God we are in that moment in time. And we find ourselves drawing near to God. And so it is that a supersized life is hardy in hard times. If you've got your Bible, turn with me a couple pages back to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter. 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter. And Again, Paul the Apostle is writing to the church and he kind of gives them this amazing statement. I, I'll just paraphrase it for you, but he talks about some hard times that they've gone through. 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter. Paul the Apostle in verse number 8 says, We're hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. These are some hard times. These are some hard times that he's talking about, Paul the Apostle. And if anybody we can see through the life of Paul that he has experienced some difficult moments in his life. Having been stoned and left for dead, having had to been left, uh, hand, uh, you know, escaping the city of, uh, 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 in a basket, being lowered down by night, having been shipwrecked, having been left at, uh, afloat at the sea, having been snake bit, beaten, imprisoned. And finally going to Rome to meet his, his final calling in life to, to give his life for his belief and for the name of Jesus Christ. He says that we are hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And he goes on and he describes the hard times that he has. But look what he goes on to say. Verse number 16, therefore... Therefore, because of all these things, because of the hard times you and I have had, because of the hard times, he says, that I have had, don't look at me, he says, and lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our, Listen to what Paul says here. For our light affliction. Now, I don't know about you, but getting beat by rods, Getting stoned, being shackled in prison, being shipwrecked and left at sea, a day and a night floating, wondering if you're going to ever survive. Hey, how about this getting bit by a snake? Psst, a venomous snake at that. I don't know about you, but I don't consider that to be really light affliction. I consider that to be, I mean, look at Jonah. They threw Jonah over the ship. 
because of a storm. See, now that's light affliction. You're sailing and the seas get rough. That's light affliction. Paul was shipwrecked three times. Boat sank. Gone. Floating in the ocean. There was no whale that swallowed him. That fed him. And he says, but don't be. Don't lose heart over our light affliction. Don't, don't worry about the things that you're going through. Don't worry about the hard times because even though the outward, it's hard. And even though the outward, it hurts on the inward, the, the inward man, the, 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 the soul that God is united and connected with, you are being renewed day by day. You are being refreshed day by day by the power of God. For our light affliction was but for a moment is working for us a far more and exceeding an eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. He says, don't be, don't lose heart when you face hard times. But rather a supersized life is hardy when it faces hard times. I was reading this article, I'm a geek, I'm a nerd. I like the things of science and I like math and numbers. I've talked about these things before. I was reading this article about a study. Now, you're going to really, you're going to be like, Pastor Leek, you actually read this article. It was about people who bore into trees and study the rings of trees. All right. Now, if you ever know anything about a tree, if you ever cut a tree down, if you ever been to like a national park or something like that, you always know that a growth ring in a tree is those little rings that, you know, that are on the circles of trees. And each growth ring represents a year of the life of that tree. And so they were studying these trees. I know, I know, this is incredibly boring. I could have found such a better example. But they were studying these trees in areas and seasons of drought, something that you and I, again, are familiar with, being the second low, uh, below average year of rain that we've had. Now we're entering into an official drought season. So you know that they're not going to allow you to do anything that involves fire or flame or heat. You know, but they were studying trees in seasons of drought, and they found this tree in the Colorado River Basin that was dated. It was a Douglas fir tree that was dated to 333, 323 B.C., so 323 years before the birth of, birth of Christ. Well, 320 years before the birth of Christ. This tree was planted, or this tree had germinated and became a tree. So now this tree is uh, multiple thousands of years old, and they found it while examining... This tree, they could look at the seasons of drought, the seasons of low water, the seasons of low water flow. Hard times if you're a tree that needs water to grow. When you don't have water, those are hard times. And they were looking at this tree and they noticed something about the rings or the growth rings on this tree. That when there was low water, the growth rings were tightly compacted together over several years. And they actually had found that there was a mega drought somewhere in 700 uh, AD, 800 AD that lasted about 100 years. So we have a couple bad years of drought. There was a drought that lasted about 100 years in the Colorado River Basin. And in this particular tree, the growth rings had grown tightly together. And then as the water began to, to flow and as the seasonal, uh, the, the, the drought ended and the water seasons rise and the snow packs rose and now water was abundant, the growth rings began to expand and they would get wider and they would get wider and they would get wider. Much like in, in, in times of financial hardship, we may not eat as well. So those fat rings around the belly might taper off a little bit, but then we got that extra couple bucks in our pocket. We start eating, all of a sudden we get those growth rings that grow a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? But that struck a chord with me, and the reason why is that one of the things I love to do is I love to woodwork. I have a little wood shop in my garage, and I, I build small things and, and things around our house, things that benefit my wife and I and stuff of that nature. And one of the things that every woodworker knows is that they look at wood grain. Because wood grain is the character of whatever you're going to do. Now, if you're going to cover it up with paint and whatever. But wood grain, if you're going to build something out of wood, you want to look at the grain because the grain tells you a lot about that. And when grain is tightly packed together, you know something about that piece of wood. You know that, one, it's going to last for centuries after it's been cut down after it's been milled and brought into a piece of furniture. That's why there are many pieces of furniture that are built in the 16, 17, 1800s that are in existence today in antique shops because the grain or the wood of those days had been tightly packed together. The grain had been, had brought, had been brought tight together. The trees didn't grow as fast and as flourishing as they did when they were like what well, you and I live in now in, in the days of forestation when they plant new trees and they cut them down shortly after they've been planted. And the, the growth rings are far apart. 
You see, a tightly packed tree or a tightly packed piece of wood gives that wood great stability. See, in times of hardships, the tree doesn't grow like it grows in times of plentiful. But the tree does something that it needs to do, and that is the tree establishes its position. It hunkers down. It, it, it doesn't focus on the outward growth, but more so it focuses on the inward growth. And the cells and the molecules and the, and the, and the, and the, the bits and pieces on the inside of that tree grow tightly, intergrained together so that it becomes functional, so that it becomes efficient, so that what little bit of water, what little bit of life-sustaining water it gets, it uses the most of. There's a lesson to be learned in that. That when it's, time, uh, when it's times of hardship that you and I would gather together, that we would hunker down, that we do this in our finances, that we look and say, okay, what are the things that are on the excess that I can get rid of? But in times of hardship, we come to God and we say, God, oh, I want you. God, oh, I need you. God, oh, change me. God, forgive me. God, cleanse me. God, renew me. But we do little to change what's done on the inside. We do little. We expect God to just allow us to be the way that we are, but rather, like the tree, you and I have got to become hardy in our times and look to the inside, look to the inward man. Like Paul said, the outward might be having a hard time, but the inward is becoming strengthened. So like that tree, it can live thousands and thousands of years and be flourishing and survive times of drought. Survive times of burning through forest fire. Survive the, 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 the years of, of, of mankind and things of that nature. And to live uh, and to stand a staple, to stand a monument. To say, here I am, a Christian. Not like those around me that call themselves, but here I am, a Christian. Standing a monument to the faithfulness of God that even though times are hard, I live a supersized life because I may not be growing tall right now, but on the inside, the inward man is being renewed day by day. So a supersized life is hardy in hard times. Number two, a supersized life is supernatural in understanding. A supersized life is supernatural in understanding. Now, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, a couple pages back. 1 Corinthians in the second chapter. A supersized life is supernatural in the understanding. You see, oftentimes we come to the church, we open up our Bible. And we look at it. You've been there. Hey, I've been there. You look at the Bible, you read the scripture, and you do this. Huh? No, no, no. Read something else that you want to understand. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But oftentimes we hear, the Bible's too difficult to read. The Bible's too difficult to understand. You see, the Bible was written and inspired by the hand of God. The Bible was written and inspired by the Holy Spirit. And don't you know that if the Holy Spirit can inspire men to write the Bible, to pen down the thoughts of God, the nature of God, the attributes of God, the will of God, and the Holy Spirit can inspire men throughout the centuries to preserve it, to make sure that it is provided to those so that they can read it, so that they can grab a hold of it, so that they can understand it, so that they can live according to what the Word of God says, not just the, 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 what the traditions of man says, then don't you know that God, through the Holy Spirit, can inspire you and I to have a sense of understanding and discernment when it comes to life. And that you and I ought to have a supernatural uh, understanding or a supernatural discernment on the things of God that are good in our lives, on the things of God that are bad in our lives, on the things of God that are beneficial to us, on the things of God that we ought to stray away from or turn away from, on how we raise our kids, on how we spend our money, on how we work in our jobs, on how we invest in our businesses. Don't you know that you and I ought to have a supernatural understanding because we've got the maker of all all things, the creator of the universe at our disposal when it comes to understanding the things of God and understanding the things of this world. You see, the Bible tells us that the things of this world are all of God's and the fullness thereof. God has everything in his hands. God understands how everything works. You can pull out that little phone in your pocket and not know how it works, but God does. And we make this profession of our faith for witty and inventions and ideas and wise investments. Why don't we as supersized Christians begin to believe that God can take the, the wealth of this world 
and what, what, the, what the world sees as successful is nothing in the eyes of God, is nothing in the possibilities of God. And God can take you and I, people who know nothing in the things of this world, and he can advance us. Why? Because we have supernatural understanding, because we've got God on our side. Second Corinthians in the second, first Corinthians, I'm sorry, first Corinthians in the second chapter, 10th verse. It says, but God has revealed them. Now them is the previous verses talking about the hidden wisdom of God, the hidden things of God. Now God has revealed the hidden wisdom of the things of God to us through his spirit. See, the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. It is not God's intention for you and I to live shallow understandings of the precepts of the will of God. It is not God's understanding for us to understand just solely what men tell us to do, but rather what God tells us to do. That is why the scriptures have been preserved and written for you and I to read and to understand and to grab a hold of them so that the Spirit can speak to us. See, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? In other words, you can't know, if you look to your neighbor, you don't know the inner beings of that person. Why? Because you're not that person. But you can look to your own self and say, I know everything about myself. I know the feelings that I'm having right now. I know the issues that I'm going through. I know all the things. I know everything. I know about all of the education that I've gone through. I know about all. I know everything. I can look at myself in the mirror and say, I know all about Luke Cobra. Because you are the spirit of man. But look what it goes on to say. For man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So here he's saying that you and I, we can't know God because we're not God. But look what he goes on to say. He gives us a promise. But now we have received the gift. Or we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things which have been freely given to us by God. You see, now you and I have the ability through the Holy Spirit to understand and to know God on a deep, on an intimate level, the deepest and, 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 and most valuable parts of the Spirit of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God himself is on the inside of us. And so just like the, the Spirit of man can only know the inside of him because we have God in us, now we have the ability to know the deep parts of God and the wisdoms of God. And don't you know that if God knows everything, if God is all wise, is everywhere all at once... That God knows a great many things and now you and I have been given access through the Holy Spirit to the things of God. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is James in the first chapter. It says, if anybody lacks wisdom, ask. Yeah. Most of the time in the young adults ministry, people come up to me after, after service. Pastor Luke, I need advice about a job. Pastor Luke, I need advice about my girlfriend. Pastor Luke, I need advice about, about my schooling. Pastor Luke, I need advice about this or that or that or this or that. Generally, the first thing I'll tell them, they, they stop coming after a while because they know I'm going to keep telling them the same thing. If anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask. And so I'll tell them, I'll say, look, let's pray right now together and let's ask for wisdom. Let's ask for understanding. You see, we have been given access. We have been granted access to God Almighty who knows all because of the Holy Spirit. Much like Peter and John as they were before the Sanhedrin Council in Acts, the fourth chapter. As they were defending their faith, as they were standing for what they believed, the Bible says in Acts, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, now when they, the, the council, saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. You see, education doesn't mean anything in the advancement of this world. I've heard it said, even as a college graduate, I didn't like the statement, but I looked at my life and it actually applied to me. I heard it once said that people go to college to work for people that never went to college. And I thought, no, nah, that's not right. And then I looked over at my life and I looked over and said, well, who's my employer? Who's my boss? Pastor Jim Colbray, who says that he has a fifth grade reading level, that pastors in San Bernardino. And here's this college grad 
working for somebody because the Spirit of God came upon him because he's not defined by degrees, by letters, by, by, by things that follow names, but rather by the Spirit of God within him. And let that be a sign to you and I, whether you're educated, whether you have doctorates in theology or biology, or whether you barely or didn't even graduate high school, let Peter and John be the example that it doesn't matter about your college education system. You and I are educated by God Almighty, by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, and we have been called to have a supernatural understanding about the things of God. And so don't walk around even though you may feel stupid, even though you may not speak good English. Doesn't matter because you have supernatural understanding by the Spirit of God. You know what that means? That means that you're genius. That means that you're brilliant. That means that Albert Einstein ain't got nothing on you. Why? Because you've got God on you. And you go about life. Now all of a sudden you can kind of hold your head a little bit higher, your shoulders a little bit back, you know, and say, you know what? You got a college education. That's all right. I got Jesus Christ education on me. And I know because the Bible says I can ask for wisdom. Are you with me tonight? Talking about a supersized life. Number three, supersized life is ever increasing in faith. A supersized life is ever increasing in faith. You see, faith by its nature is not intended to be stagnant. Idleness is the antithesis, the opposite of faith. But rather, faith is intended to be used, to be practiced upon, to be expanded on. Charles Spurgeon says, little faith will bring you or bring your soul to heaven. Little faith will bring your soul to heaven. But great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Little faith will bring your soul to heaven. You can live a regular life and not live a supersized life. It's your choice. But great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Great faith will bring to you a supersized life. Because God has great intentions and plans for you. If you've got your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews, a few pages forward in the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews in the 10th chapter. I love Hebrews in the 10th chapter. We'll get there in a few years. <laughs> Hebrews the 10th chapter is a cool chapter. The thing about Hebrews the 10th chapter is oftentimes Hebrews the 10th chapter gets overshadowed by the following chapter, the 11th chapter. Sometimes, most of the time, somebody's going to crack open their Bible and it falls over to Hebrews. And you've got the 10th chapter on one side, the 11th chapter on the other side. More often than not, you're going to read the 11th chapter because you know that as the hall of faith. Yeah. But I love the 10th chapter because it sets up the hall of faith. Hebrews in the 10th chapter. Verse number 36. For you have need of endurance, that hardiness that we spoke of earlier... So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Going back and quoting, it says, For yet a little while he who is coming will come and not tarry. Now the just shall live by what? Faith. The just shall live by what? Faith. And if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, God says. The just shall live by faith. The Bible says that we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. Now here's the Spirit of God speaking and says, if anybody draws back from their faith, my soul has no pleasure in them. Jesus said anybody who, put, anybody who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Because God's intent for you and I to live a supersized life is to have faith and to have our faith continually growing, not shrinking. Like we talked about in those times of hardness, those are times when our faith is pressed. But he goes on to say, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition or draw back to trouble, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. And then it goes on in the very next verse of the 11th chapter, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it goes on to speak about the hall of faith and everybody who has lived a life of faith, those who have lived their lives without seeing the promises of God come to fruition, but knowing that God is faithful and able to follow through. 
You see, you and I have got to have a life of faith that continually advances, a life of faith that continually grows, that does not shrink back or fall back on trouble, but rather that continually pushes ahead and says, you know what? God came through on me this time. Now I know that I can rely on God, and I know that God's going to come through to me even bigger the next time, and even bigger the next time, and even bigger the next time, and even bigger the next time. Not to drive home the, the subject of finances too much, but you know, we've entered into this financial campaign. You know, I administered this whole process, this freedom for our future. Since August of last year, I have done nothing but given this my attention. I have had dreams about members of our staff sleeping in my bed because I have spent so much time with them planning this thing that it, it just doesn't escape me. And it was interesting, as a, a friend of ours church is going through the same process. And his administrator called me. And he was where I was in December. And I remember vividly December because I had my baby daughter in December. And I remember that on top of my baby daughter spending 10 days in the intensive care unit, I was panicking because we were about to start thinking about Pre pre uh, preemptively launching it. Now, did you get that? We were about to start thinking about preemptively launching. All right? Which means we weren't even in this thing yet. And I was panicking about that. And I remember as he called me, he was in the same process that I was. And he called me, and he was panicking just as I was. And I was on the other end of the phone. And I just said, hey, man, I remember where you're at. But you know what? Here we are. We hadn't done the launch. We hadn't done any of this thing yet. And I just said, you know what, though? I've got the peace of God on me now because I've seen that God's hand is in this. That I've seen that God hand, God's hand is on these people. That I have seen that God is faithful. That I have seen that I'm not believing or hoping to raise $13 million and, and, and be satisfied with eight or nine. But rather, I'm believing that we're going to see 15 to 20 so that Iglesia La Roca will be built, so that the Rock Christian School will be built, so that this church will expand in size, and I'll be satisfied with 13. And the peace of God is upon me. Why? Because God has come through with me in the little things. And in the little things, then those little things get bigger and bigger and bigger. But my faith is ever increasing. You know, in, in, in the book of 1 Samuel, in the 17th chapter, as David goes before the king to fight Goliath, he says, you know what? Here's why I'm going to go and I'm going to fight this giant. Because there was a time when a lion tried to take one of my sheep. And I went and I killed that lion. Then there was another time that a bear came. And I grabbed that bear by his beard, and I killed that bear. And he goes on and he tells King Saul, Moreover, the Lord delivered me from the hand of the lion. The, more, the Lord delivered me from the hand of the bear. The Lord will deliver me from the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to cut his head off. Because his faith was ever growing. The first time he saw that lion, he might have said, Oh my goodness, what do I do? Well, he pulled out that little rock and that little sling and he went after it. Wow, God came through. The second time he saw the bear, he said, Psh, this bear ain't got nothing. Why? Because I got a lion. He went up to the bear. He grabbed the bear by the beard. I don't know about you. I ain't grabbing no bears. <laughs> now he's faced with a giant where the entire army is quivering at this giant's taunts. And he says, listen, this, this guy is nothing different than a bear. This guy is nothing different than a lion, even if he's been trained how to fight and how to kill from his youth. I'm going to go and I'm going to take him. I'm going to make a public spectacle of him. And I'm going to just show you how good my God is. You see, it is God's intent for us to live a life of supersized faith. A supersized life that has faith that grows, that expands, that continues to go the way God has intended us to go. Are you with me tonight? Yeah. Last one for tonight, super quick because I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. Last one for tonight, a supersized life is, number four, abundant in love. A supersized life is abundant in love. You know, love is a hard thing for you and I to grasp. We all want to be loved, but not always do we want to love. We all want to feel the emotion or we want to feel the affliction, or I'm sorry, the affection of somebody caring for you and I. But there are times in our lives where we get busy, when we don't want to give our time when we don't want to give our affection, when we don't want to sacrifice ourselves. There's that song that we sing, I give myself away that you could use me. There are times when we look at the person on the side of the road and say, I am not going to give myself away today. I got too many things going on. But a supersized life is a life abundant in love. 
I'll just go and put it up on the overheads and just for the sake of time. Ephesians in the fifth chapter, verse number one, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus and he says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Did you know that they've said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? My two-year-old son, I have to watch everything I say now because he is in that imitating mode. He's in that imitating phase of his life. I'll start clapping my hands, and he'll walk around clapping his hands just like Daddy. Why? Because for this point in time, he looks up to Daddy and he says, I want to be just like Dad. You and I ought to be like little children that look at God and say, I want to be just like God. And my flattery, my sincereness towards God means that I am going to imitate. I want to reflect. I want people to see him when they look at me. And walk in love, it says in verse number two, as Christ has also loved us and given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. You and I have got to live a life of love. You and I have got to live a life around us of giving, around us of stretching out, of, of reaching out, of pouring ourselves out, whether it be emotionally, whether it be by time, whether it be by resources, whether it be by finances, whatever it might be, we have got to live a life where we do not continually hold on to the things that we have been given, but rather understand that we have been given things by God so that we can turn around and give them to others so that God can be glorified. And a supersized life is a life abundant in love. In 1 John, the third chapter, verse number 16, 1 John 3, 16, it says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The, the, the song that we sing, I give myself away so that you can use me. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself to you, the lyrics of that song should be the cry of our heart, God, I am not here. I am not in this supersized life for my own benefit. But God, I am in this supersized life so that I might glorify you and bring the glory of God and the love of God and the peace of God, the blessings of God, the wealth of God to those around me so that they could glorify you as well. A life abundant in love. A supersized life. Number one, a supersized life for us is hardy in hard times. A supersized life, number two, is supernatural in our understanding. Number three, is in, supersized life is increasing in faith. Number four, a supersized life is abundant in love. Now Ephesians in the third chapter, verse number 19. Reading about all the things that Paul had prayed for. Ephesians the third chapter, could you guys put verse number 19 on the screen? Ephesians 3.19, he says, To the knowledge of the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you, that you and I may be filled, filled up with the fullness of God. Not that we be filled with food, not that we be filled with the fullness of the world, not that we be filled in our bank accounts, be filled and overflowing, not that we be filled in the, in the successes of the world, but rather that you and I would be filled, would be supersized in the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Supersize me is a phrase coined by the food industry to ensure that we leave full. Paul exhorts the church that we would be filled with the fullness of God. And when we are full, we are satisfied. When we are satisfied, we are supersized. Amen. A supersized life is a life filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Amen. Well, praise God. I'll tell you what. God is good. Amen. I want to ask you this question. Very important. You know, it would be a shame for us to get together to worship God, to, to remember those who have given their lives in the service of our country and to hear the word of God in our lives and to not leave or to not give you this place without, to not, to not give you the opportunity before leaving this place to examine your heart and your life with God. So let me ask you this question. If you were to die tonight and you were to, or if you were to leave tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? You see, it's a relatively simple question, but why don't we go over those answers that you might have had? Did you know that you can't get to heaven because you think so or because you want to? Because you hope so? That nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that you can get into heaven because you think so, because you want to, or because you hope so. 
Hey, did you know? You might say, well, I, I thought I was going to get to heaven because I wasn't raised any other way. So I just thought that by default, Christians go to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or any other type of world religion that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere will you find that. You can't get to heaven that way. You know, you might even think, well, Pastor Luke, as a kid, my parents took me to church. I was baptized. I was christened. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. I went to church on Easter. My parents told me I was a Christian. I have a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck. I've even got a tattoo with a scripture reference or a cross on my body. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were baptized, you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere will you find that because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter or because you uh, attended church or Sabbath or Sunday school or catechism classes. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian or because you've given yourself the title of Christian mean that you're going to get into heaven? You can't get into heaven that way. There's nowhere in the Word of God you'll find that. You know, you, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, I've never done anything wrong. I've never done bad things. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I've never cheated on my taxes. I've done more good in my life than bad. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, because you give to charitable organizations, because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven, because you don't drive too fast on the freeway, that you're going to get into heaven. The Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God and His righteousness are like filthy rags. You see, nothing on our own, nothing that we could do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. Yet so many people believe that they're going to get to heaven because all they have to do is be a good person. When the reality is, is that's not how to get to heaven. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I, I, I was a volunteer in the youth or the children's. I carried the pastor's Bible. I sang in the choir. I went to church. I mean, I'm here tonight. Doesn't that mean something? Doesn't that say something? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because, you're a, uh, because you carried the pastor's Bible, that because you memorized John 3.16 or know some things about the Word of God, that because you volunteered in the youth or the children's group, that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us about an encounter Jesus had with a man by the name of Nicodemus. And Jesus and Nicodemus were having this subject of talking about the subject of eternal life. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, the way to get into heaven. And Jesus says this, you must be born again. You see, it's not about what you do on the outside. It's not about how good you look. It's not about how much money you give to the church or to the organizations. It's not about how you give to the guy on the side of the street or how you come and sit in church and attend or populate a chair. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way or what the world says. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way. It's God's heaven and it's God's way. And Jesus tells us that you and I have got to be born again. Now you've heard that term before. Hollywood popular culture's made a mockery. You think of weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. Hollywood popular culture society has no concept of the things of God. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's intent means this, that you've given him all of your heart, that you've given him all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with God. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Hey, hey, look at me, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not going to find themselves in heaven. The Bible tells us that the devil himself knew the scriptures as he quoted them to Jesus. Yet he's not going to find himself in heaven. Why? Because God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me prove that to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church, people like you and I, hearing the word of God, doing good things. And he says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot. I better find you cold. Because if I find you, he says, lukewarm. I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement from the words of Jesus Christ, from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it for you in terms of your relationship with God. It means that you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. You know, you're a little bit up and you're a little bit down. You're kind of floating around in your relationship with God. You're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. You're kind of doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing, in and out, in and out, up and down, ping-ponging in your relationship with God. And if that's you, you are deceived in thinking, I love you enough, listen, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're deceived in thinking that you're right with God and that you're going to make it into heaven. But I, here I am, I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to tell you the truth, and I want to give you the opportunity. You say, Pastor Luke, well, how do we get there? You know, you can't get there your way 
hey, you can't get there my way. We can't come to God and say, God, I'm going to do, do things my way and believe that we're going to get there. The only way we can get into heaven, God's heaven, is God's way. And Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it any other way but God's way. I'm going to give you that moment and just, an opportunity in just a moment. And here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible real loud, just like that. Bang. And in just a moment, I want to give you the opportunity in this place to ensure your position with God in heaven forever, leaving hell behind, not worrying about where you're going to go when you die. And what I'm going to do when I count to three and I smack my hand on the Bible, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I, that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to go forward in my relationship with God. I want to leave hell behind. I want to give Jesus all of my heart. I want to give him all my life. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm not going to be able to do that. You're asking me to make a statement. You're asking me to raise my hand. People are going to see me. I'm going to be embarrassed. Hey, you know what? You might be embarrassed. I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you are embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward in your relationship with God? You see, Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his Father. But if you deny him before men, he will deny you before his Father. The decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way in. You've got to choose to give him all of your heart, to give him all of your life. He's already done everything he could to ensure that you don't go to that place called hell that was not designed for you, but rather you go to heaven and spend eternity with him in paradise. You see, God's already done everything he could by giving for us his son, Jesus Christ, a beaten, bloody mess, to die on a cross, a spectacle for the world to see so that you and I could give our heart and our life to him. So who should raise their hand in just a moment? If you've never given him all your heart, if you've never given him all your life in just a moment, when I count to three and I smack my hand on my Bible, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. Who should raise their hand? If you're in this place and you're not sure, let's make sure today, don't leave this place without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you've done this at a harvest or a Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through. You never really gave into it. You never really put your whole effort into it today. Pop your hand up so I can see it in just a moment. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. And finally, who should raise their hand? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, tonight, if that's you, pop your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it. I'll put it right back down. We'll move forward from there. Let's leave hell behind and ensure your place for eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever in heaven with God. The decision is yours. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't let this moment pass you by. I'm going to count to three if that's you in this place, whether you're sitting in the front or the back, in the family rooms, if you're out in the foyer watching by television or listening outside in the courtyard, wherever you're at, stop what you're doing in just a moment and you raise your hand and you show and you make that profession saying, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart, give him all of my life. Hands all over this place. Get ready to go up. The Spirit of God is on you at this place tonight. If that's you, don't miss out. Here we go. Ready? I'm going to count. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you. One, two, three, four, five. I see you guys. Five wise people. Anybody else? Six. I see you. I, you, I got you guys. You can put your hands down. Six wise people. Anybody else in this place tonight? Anybody else in this place tonight? Six wise people. Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else in this place? You say, I want to give Jesus Christ all my heart. I want to give him all my life. Come on. Today's your day. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Anybody else today? Six wise people. Praise God. Well, hey, listen, let's praise God for six wise uh, people today. Here's what I want to do really quickly, what we're going to do. You said you want to give them all your heart. You said you want to give them all your life. You said, I want to give them. Now let's help you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you. I want to get some things into your hand. So here's what we're going to do in just a moment. We're going to all stand together and sing a song. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend, if you need a friend, somebody that you came with, that's okay. As we all stand, I want you to grab your coat and grab those things. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisle and come and meet me here at the altar. You said you were going to give them all your heart. You said you were going to give them all your life. Come on, if you're serious about this, let's all stand together. And if that's you, come on, you can come and meet me up here today. Come on, let's pray together. If that's you, from the back, from the front, wherever you're at, you come, come on. You can come. I surrender all and I surrender all Praise God Unto Thee my blessed Savior I surrender all Hallelujah. 
Hey, guess what? Two things. You guys were quick. Praise God. Eager. Hey, listen, today is the first day of the rest of your life. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Come on, my friend. We'll wait for you. Hey, listen, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is one of the coolest guys you're going to meet. Nothing weird goes on. I promise I'm as weird as it gets. He's going to take you just right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. He's going to give you some free things, some literature to help you get strong in the ways of God. You say, hey, I, I, you wonder, I just got saved. Now what do I do? Well, we want to help you get, figure out the next step. So we're going to give you some things, put some things into your hand so that you can get for, go, move forward in your relationship with God. The third thing he's going to do is he's going to uh, give away a friend. We give friends away here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. They're called SPTs or Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you see personal trainer, they help you. They make sure that you're working the, the weights and the muscles the right way so you don't waste your time. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend. Somebody will meet with you right before church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee. They'll teach you some things about the, uh, the Word of God for a couple of weeks here to get you strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to the life that you came from and you go forward in your relationship with God. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.